Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining. And um, again, for thanks again for the patience with our uh, small technical difficulties with the uh, email link this morning. Uh, I wanted to introduce Justin, who is a technical marketer here at HashiCorp, and he's going to provide us with an overview of um, how to inject uh, vault secrets into Kubernetes, Kubernetes pods via Sidecar. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we're going to uh, leave uh, some room towards the end for everyone to have their questions answered, but you can ask questions throughout the whole presentation. So we'll be aggregating them and we'll be able to like go through them uh, towards the end. And we, we have allotted uh, 20 minutes for that towards the very end of the presentation. Um, I also wanted to make sure that everyone knows that the webinar is being recorded and we will make this recording available to everyone that signed up. Uh, so just so that everyone knows that they'll have access to this information even um, even if they are not able to join today. Um, but like I said, um, feel free to put your questions as we go through everything and we'll make sure that everything gets answered towards the end once we have the, the Q&A in the last 20 minutes of the presentation. And with that, I'll let uh, Justin get started and off you go, Justin. Hey, Ed, thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to be here, and uh, thanks for everyone for uh, joining today. So um, just before the holidays in 2019, we released um, a new Vault and Kubernetes integration that allows applications with no sort of Vault logic built in to grab secrets out of Vault. And this is made possible through a new tool called Vault K8, which leverages the Kubernetes mutation uh, webhook to sort of intercept and augment specifically annotated pod definitions for secret injection. And I think that's very loaded, but uh, hopefully today through the demos and we'll sort of walk through it step-by-step step building up um, uh, sort of the logic of how this all works. Um, so uh, I think Edward introduced me, I'm Justin and uh, I work on the technical marketing team here and we, uh, sort of produce demos and do walkthroughs and stuff like this. So definitely feel free to ask technical questions and if uh, I'll try my best to answer them. But if I don't have the answers, uh, you know, I think when you signed up for the webinar, we grabbed your email so I can email you folks uh, as well. All right, let's dive in. So here's sort of the agenda for today. Um, I imagine a lot of people probably even wonder why would you even want to inject vault secrets into Kubernetes pods? Why not just use uh, Kubernetes itself? You know, it has secrets. And so I sort of wanted to talk about like vault 101. Why would you even want to do this when uh, Kubernetes already has a secrets engine? And then um, we'll jump into some demos because I think that's probably where you will get a good sense of how this actually works. So what is vault and why would you even want to do this? Well, let's say you're a, a large enterprise, like a Fortune 1000 or something like that. And you know, you have a, maybe you have a, maybe you're an online retailer and you have um, like an online store. Uh, typically on your front end, say web servers there, you're gonna have all sorts of secrets sprinkled throughout your infrastructure. You're gonna have, um, you know, certificates for encrypting customer traffic. You're gonna have uh, API keys for, you know, payments processing. You're gonna have API keys to be sending emails, email receipts to customers. You're gonna have uh, database credentials. And sort of, we see this secrets ball that happens throughout uh, people's infrastructure where, you know, maybe you have a web team, maybe you have a backend infrastructure team, maybe you have a database team. And each one of these teams has sort of implemented their own workflow for securing secrets. And as your company grows, this becomes quite a problem because uh, you're not using a standardized workflow or a standardized tool to sort of put all these secrets into a central place. This is sort of the core problem that uh, Vault solves, is it creates a central repository where you can put all your secrets and you have a, a sort of a unified workflow across teams and then you know you can access your secrets via api via web ui or via cli and you know vault um, uh, can be audited and logged so you know everyone's using this consistent workflow and you have consistent metrics coming out uh, the other side so that's sort of why you'd use vault but why would you use vault in kubernetes well if you sort of think about how does this roll into like a large enterprise? If they are 
you know, wanting to use Kubernetes, maybe they want to use it on their front end web tier so they can uh, quickly iterate in a, say, a CI CD pipeline or something like that. Do you really want to implement uh, another sort of secrets workflow using, um, say, Kubernetes secrets? I'm not saying that uh, you shouldn't do that. Like if you're, uh, if that works for you, then totally do it. Especially if you're, uh, say, a you know a, a one man show or something like that. Uh, Vault might be overkill for your needs. So uh, this is targeted at people who have lots of secrets. Um, so that's sort of the core reason why you'd use Vault and Kubernetes together, and, rather than say the Kubernetes secret engine, in that. For a lot of organizations, they're already running Vault, and they now say, hey, uh, we're using Kubernetes, and we want to inject some of our existing secrets into apps we're already running. Uh, how do we do that? Um, so I think probably the best way to just demonstrate this is just to show you. And then if you have questions along the way, make sure you ask them, and uh, we'll sort of work through it uh, together. So I just wanted to flip over. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone sort of has a base level understanding of what Kubernetes is and what containers are. And um, I'm going to show you a Helm chart. You, you don't have to understand Helm. I'll sort of walk through it uh, as we go. But um, on the Kubernetes side, I'm using Google Cloud here. And I've spun up a uh, three node Kubernetes cluster. Um, and I just wanted to walk through some links. At the end, I'll show you uh, reference links as well. And uh, so you can go and walk through this yourself. I've uh, created a GitHub repo. Um, I'll, I'll share this link at the reference uh, section at the end. But uh, if you want to grab it, you can go through and walk through this demo on your own. I, I'm going to show you all the commands that I used uh, throughout the demo and sort of like why, why I'm doing these various things. There's also a couple really helpful um, YouTube videos. When we first launched this uh, feature, we created a quick eight minute sort of walkthrough video, which is pretty dense um, with uh, content. Also, we did a, a dynamic uh, secrets uh, webcast where uh, Nick Jackson sort of walked through using dynamic credentials with the um, sidecar injection. So if you're interested in that, definitely check this out. This I'd say is sort of more advanced once you understand the uh, core concepts, you can jump onto this. And then there's a whole slew of uh, reference links, uh, like the blog post when we first announce it that walks through this uh, sort of in detail, and then a bunch of GitHub repos. Um, you know, for the Helm chart, for the uh, sidecar injection feature, and then there's lots of documentation. So I think on the doc side, you're definitely covered. Um, so if uh, you have any questions, I'll try to point you at the docs. Um, and then you get, you know, there's tons of examples in here if you uh, want to go through and like uh, understand something in detail. All right, so let's jump over to the console. Um, so in here, I'm running a kube cluster nodes. So it's just a three node Kubernetes cluster running on uh, Google Cloud. And then um, in the, I like to sort of have a split panel here on the top, I'll do my work. And then in the bottom, I'm just going to run the, uh, Oops, sorry about that. Just going to run the watch command. And this is going to grab um, just sort of pods as they're spinning up. So we can, as we're, as we're running commands up here, we can sort of see what's happening, what the state changes are in the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so in the directory here, I have um, some example files. These are also in the GitHub repo, which uh, I showed earlier, and I'll, I'll paste the link into. But um, basically, I have Vault Helm here. We're going to use this to uh, install a Vault cluster onto the Kubernetes cluster. A uh, question that often comes up is, hey, um, you know, I don't want to run Vault on Kubernetes. We already have an existing Vault cluster sitting in my organization, and I just want to leverage secrets um, from this external cluster into Kubernetes. That's uh, something that's totally doable, and it's uh, you just need to um, edit the annotations to point at your external server. Obviously, you're going to uh, need to make sure that um, you know Vault is able to talk to Kubernetes and traffic can go back and forth. So there might be some you know network wrangling that needs to happen there. Um, 
There's also an open GitHub issue that uh, talks about how we should, um, you know, add an example for docs, and that's something we're working on right now. All right, so let's go ahead and um, install Vault, and then we'll sort of walk through uh, setting this up. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a namespace uh, within Kubernetes just to run our demo, and then I'm going to set the context just so that when we're running commands, we're actually running them in this uh, demo namespace. You know, if you're gonna run this demo on your own, I'd suggest just spinning up an example cluster. That way you're not uh, impacting anything you uh, have going on right now. And then we're going to install Helm. I'm just copying and pasting these commands just so it goes uh, quicker. Um, so I'm saying Helm install. I'm uh, using a, I'm setting the uh, Vault server to run in dev mode. This just sort of bypasses a lot of the checks that uh, Vault will do, especially if you're gonna just play around with it or you're doing hands-on labs or something like that. Highly recommend uh, running in dev mode. Um, but the Helm chart also supports uh, running in standalone mode or in HA mode. You know, say um, if you wanna spin up a Vault server that's uh, highly available, then definitely use the HA mode. All right, and then down in the bottom window here, we should see the Vault uh, vault dev instance come up and then you also see this uh, sidecar injection service come up so what's happening here behind the scenes is the uh, helm chart has uh, obviously spun up vault but it's also modified the kubernetes instance to intercept specifically annotated pods and so i just want to highlight this because um, say, for example, you're working through this demo and something breaks and you're sort of wondering, hey, uh, how, I wonder how things are wired up. There's this uh, Kubernetes guy that sort of talks through how uh, admission controller webhooks actually work. And I think this diagram sort of illustrates it really well. So when an API request comes into Kubernetes, it uh, goes through various checks, but we're able to um, sort of intercept uh, you know, pod definitions as they go through the, the API, and we can link in our own webhook. So what we've done with this integration is we've created a vault injection um, uh, webhook here that as specifically annotated uh, pod definitions come through, which I'll show you in a second, we're able to intercept them and then augment them or change them to say, hey, you know what? We actually want to inject a sidecar or an init container. And then uh, when it exits this uh, stage here, you know, Kubernetes will actually enact those changes. So that's sort of the magic behind the scenes that makes this work. Um, all right. So now that we have this up and running, I want to um, connect into the Vault server, and we're just gonna do some configuration to make sure that Vault is able to uh, talk with Kubernetes. And I'll just sort of walk through how this works as we're doing it. All right, so I'm connected into the, this uh, Vault dev server now. And then um, I'm just gonna paste this and then I'll talk through it. So, as we're injecting secrets into Kubernetes pods, uh, we obviously want to have some sort of uh, check or authorization happen so that, hey, you know what? We don't fire up a container and it's able to just pull down all the secrets sitting in Vault. So we want to set up sort of a policy and access rules around what container or what pod is able to pull down what secrets. So there's this link that needs to happen. And uh, Vault has this uh, concept of policies where we can say, hey, you know what, for this particular role, it's only act able to access these particular secrets. So what I'm doing here is basically setting up a policy that says, hey, you know what, I want the read capability for this particular path, which is secret star. This is obviously very uh, wide open, but uh, for the demo, it's more than sufficient. And then I'm gonna uh, link it to this uh, policy. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna write this policy into Vault, um, just like that. We're saying, hey, you know what? We wanna write this uh, app policy, which is basically this here that says, hey, you know what? You can read any secret you want. And then um, we'll use that in a, a minute. I'm sort of just doing some of the groundwork. You only have to do this once when you're setting it up, but uh, I'd rather sort of walk through each step, step by step so that we gradually build up the the concept of how this works. Again, if something breaks, then you're definitely gonna wanna uh, know about this stuff. 
Then we're going to turn on um, the Vault Kubernetes integration. Basically, what's going to happen here is we need to make sure that Vault is able to talk to Kubernetes to say, hey, you know what? Um, this pod is asking for a secret. Is it allowed to actually have it? So we're going to set up some configuration here that basically allows um, Vault to talk to Kubernetes. And then we'll add a, uh, the capability for Vault to verify uh, the service accounts when requests are coming in. All right, so this configuration here um, basically sets up the communication between uh, Vault and uh, Kubernetes. Um, obviously, since Vault is running on Kubernetes, we're, allowed, we're able to take advantage of uh, the features here of you know, grabbing the uh, authorization tokens. But if you had a, say, an external Vault uh, cluster, um, you'd probably need to export these secrets uh, or these um, you know, the CA so that you're able to actually uh, do this check. And I think if you, I think that's what the GitHub issue is referring to is that we need to document these steps. And so uh, we're working on that right now. All right, and then now that we have the, uh, now that Vault is able to talk to Kubernetes, we're gonna set up, um, we're gonna basically link a, Kubernetes service account that we haven't created yet um, to this vault policy. So uh, we're saying, hey, you know what? Anything called uh, my app, uh, the service account, is able to access uh, the policy app. Um, this will all make sense in a second, I uh, promise. <laughs> all right. So now that we have the, uh, now that we have vault up and running, now that we have vault able to communicate with Kubernetes and we have our policy set up, um, let's create some example passwords. Uh, or a secret data that we'd want to inject in some, into some pods that have no knowledge of uh, Kubernetes. So I'm just gonna copy these here and then we'll sort of talk through them. So I'm gonna create a, a secret called hello world in vault and it's a username and password. Um, say for example, maybe you wanted to, uh, if we go back to our um, say retailer example, you know, a retailer, you know, a typical web app, you're gonna have, hey, you know what, we need to access a database. Hey, we need to do payment processing. Hey, we need to send emails. Um, hey, we need to encrypt client, encrypt client traffic. So you have all these various secrets and that's just one fairly simple web service, right? So um, I wanted to create uh, something where we can connect, create a database connection string and then we'll go through and we'll create another one for an, uh, say a payment uh, processing gateway. And then uh, maybe we'll create another key for a uh, send mail API. So um, we created our three secrets and then you can just, uh, you know, list those secrets out. So we got our, this will be our hello world uh, database connection string. This will be our payment uh, processing link and this will be the uh, send mail link. Okay, now we'll exit out of here. So Vault's all configured, we have our secrets all ready. Typically in a, in a real environment, you'd already have all this uh, up and running, but uh, I just wanted to start the, from the ground up. All right, so let's look at the demos that we're gonna walk through. So we're gonna set up an example app. This is a, an app that has no knowledge of uh, Vault or anything like that. It's just a simple web server. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna inject secrets into the file system here. And you know, you could use this on say, maybe you're in, uh, you know, containerizing legacy apps, or maybe you wanna create an app that's just uh, agnostic. It has no knowledge of Vault. You don't wanna include our SDK or anything like that, or you know, connect to our uh, APIs. You just say, hey, you know what? Um, I wanna leverage these secrets by pulling them off the file system. Uh, so that's what we're gonna demonstrate here. There has been some questions about, hey, you know, I'm using environment variables today um, and I, I would like to inject these environment variables. Uh, that's not a supported use case. That's something we're looking at, but it's a little bit complicated in that, sure, we could probably do it with a init container where you uh, put these environment variables into the container. But running a sidecar container, it's uh, harder to inject those environment variables into uh, another container because they don't share the same uh, namespace. But, uh, you know, that might be all right if they, 
if the credentials never change. But uh, you know, with Vault, we have something called dynamic secrets, where you know uh, secrets la last for a particular time bound period, say a, an hour or something like that. And then they're rotated, uh, and it breaks that use case. So we want to find a use case or a sort of a solution that uh, works across the various uh, customer sort of use cases. All right, so we're going to create this app. And then I'm going to show you a very basic annotation. This is where we're going to um, sort of intercept intercept the uh, pod definition, and we'll inject the init and sidecar container. Oops. And then um, uh, I'll show you templating because uh, you know just injecting secret data doesn't really make sense. You actually want it in a particular format. And then I'm going to show you a more real world example where we're going to inject uh, multiple secrets. All right. So let's. Um, uh, let me just show you the app file here for a second. So here's our typical deployment. You know, this uh, there's nothing special about this. We're we're creating a, a pod called app. Um, you know, it's grabbing a, a very simple container that's just a web server. Doesn't really matter because we're injecting uh, secrets. But the sort of important piece here is that we're running a service account, and the service account is called app. And this ties back to when we fired up uh, Vault and we created that policy and we sort of linked it uh, up to Kubernetes. So now when we fire up this um, container and it has the service account linked app, now when it asks Vault, hey, can I grab this secret? You know, this is where we enforce that policy of what secrets you're allowed to actually grab. So this sort of ensures, and it's a critical check to make sure that uh, you know we don't have a container or a pod firing up and it downloads all the secrets. So you can really enforce and audit and log who's accessing what secrets. This is a super cool feature. All right, so let's uh, fire this up. And then down in the bottom window here, we should see the app container starting, right? And then you can just see uh, ready one of one. This means, hey, you know what? There's one pod. Uh, and it's fired up. And then let's connect, or let's basically just uh, list anything under Vault secrets. This is obviously going to error out because, hey, you know what? We don't. We haven't injected any Vault secrets. That path doesn't exist in this container. Um, this is just sort of a proof of concept to show you that, hey, you know what? There's no secrets in this container. It has no knowledge of Vault. Um, now let's inject some secrets and see how that works. Actually, what we can do too is uh, describe. I'm just going to describe the pod, and I want to show you that there's no annotations. So we're looking at the sort of pod metadata, and you can see, hey, you know what? There's no annotations here. And then we're going to look at this uh, patch. So what this is here is this is sort of the, uh, so we've set up all the groundwork now. We have uh, Kubernetes with Vault running on it and all the authentication and, you know, we're intercepting the webhooks. Everything's set up in the background. Now we can actually just use the system. So in a typical environment, you'd have all this set up, and then when someone says, hey, you know, we want to inject secrets into a particular container, then this is all you'd have to do, which is a super simple step. So we are just creating a, a simple annotations patch, and we're saying we're going to apply it to our uh, example application here. And so we're saying, hey, you know what? We want to add these annotations that say, yeah, I want to inject a secret. Uh, what secret do we want to inject? This is the secret hello world uh, example. Uh, this will be, say, for our uh, database connection string. This is the username and password. And what role do I want to use? All right. So um, let's go and apply this patch to our example application. Great. So down here, you can see, hey, you know what? We're firing up um, this new application. And it's going to uh, you know, cycle our old application. All right, so now you see, hey, there's two of two pods running. So what's actually going on here? Why does it say two of two versus one of one? So what happened when we added that annotation? If we go back here, you know, we made a request. It had those special annotations. The mutation and webhook intercepted the request. And now it 
it created a init container, which when, so before our application actually starts, it pre-populated those secrets. And then it also adds a sidecar container that will contact uh, Vault periodically and make sure those secrets are in sync. Um, so let's actually verify that uh, this worked. So what we're gonna do is connect into the, uh, the example application here. And, oops, sorry about that. Let me just, uh, so let me explain, I'll, I'll just paste this and then I'll tell you what's going on. So we're connecting to our example app. Um, I'm using this dash C here app. So I wanna run a, a command in a particular container running in a pod. And since there's two of two pods running or containers running in this pod, we need to specify, hey, you know what? I wanna run uh, in the app container and not my sidecar container. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to list uh, the directory contents of vault secrets. And if everything worked, we should see a hello world secret in there. Perfect. So then what we're gonna do here is we're going to, um, I'm just gonna cat the contents of that file. And so this might be counterintuitive to what you're expecting. You know, you might have expected to see, hey, just a username and password. But we're actually, what we're actually dumping here is the raw object from uh, uh, Vault. So it's basically the struct. So yeah, we have our, our data and there's a username and a password in here, but there's also metadata associated with it. Like the create time, was it deleted? Uh, what version is it? So you know, we give you the flexibility to sort of do what you want in here. And you know, you could add lots more data besides just a username and password or something like that. Um, but you're probably thinking, okay, that's cool. We injected this into the file system, but how do I actually use this, right? Like um, my application is expecting a username and password. So that's where we come into uh, templates. So let's take a look at this. Annotations. So templates allow you um, to format how secrets are presented within the file system. So um, this gives you tons of flexibility to uh, say your application that has no knowledge of Vault is expecting your secret to be in a particular format or something like that. You know, maybe you're expecting a, a particular key value string or, you know, it needs uh, some extra sort of buffering around where the secret exists or something like that. This allows you uh, to basically do whatever you want and present the, the data in whatever format you want. All you have to do is just uh, use the templating system here. So in this example, we're saying, hey, you know what? We wanna drop a Postgres uh, database connection string in here. So we're, um, this should already look sort of familiar, right? We're adding some annotations into the pod. Uh, we're grabbing our hello world secret. Um, then, then this section here is new. We're calling, we're saying, hey, you know what? We wanna use a template. So we're grabbing the, the secret and then we're, we're using these variables in here that say, hey, you know what? I wanna grab the username and I wanna grab the password. And then I'm gonna put this into a Postgres connection string. And obviously we're using the uh, service account here to make sure that you know, we're pulling down the, the appropriate secret or that we're applying the vault policy that says, hey, we're allowed to download these secrets. All right, so let's uh, run this uh, or apply this patch and then we'll um, cat the output of that uh, fi file on the file system again. And if everything works correctly, we should see it in a, you know, in a template in a uh, formatted uh, way here. Okay, um, we applied our patch. Okay, didn't look like it changed anything here. Did I pray to the demo gods or not? <laughs> All right, so we're saying basic, ah, I see what I did here. I didn't actually uh, use the template version. <laughs> All right, so I guess it would help if I use the appropriate uh, patch. All right, so we're gonna apply it. And now uh, you can see, hey, you know what? Our new one's uh, starting. Our old one, uh, once our new one is started, this one will uh, 
basically turn off, right? Terminating. So let's go and cat that uh, hello world secret. Um, so we're just gonna, again, we're gonna connect into the application. We're gonna specify the application uh, container and we're gonna grab this uh, hello world secret. Perfect. So now you can see, hey, you know what? We got our Postgres connection string. You know, this is just an example. In a real world scenario, you're probably gonna have, um, uh, you know, all sorts of different formats. So this uh, template, Engine basically just gives you the flexibility to do whatever you want, um, which is pretty awesome in that it's super flexible. But, you know, let's look at maybe a, a sort of a real world example because, you know, when I was talking about that retailer, you know, you're going to have uh, uh, all sorts of secrets being injected into uh, a particular app. You know, one app isn't just going to need one secret. Uh, typically, you know, we're going to do uh, payment processing. We're going to be sending emails. We're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to be connecting to a database to make sure everything's in sync. So let's take a look at um, the real world example here. So this, uh, you know, sort of builds on the knowledge that we've uh, uh, sort of reviewed so far, right? We are looking at the annotations. We're um, saying, hey, you know what? We want to grab the hello world secret. Um, this uh, block here is basically saying, hey, you know what? We're going to inject our Postgres connection string. And then we're grabbing a, another secret out of Vault. We're saying, hey, you know what? We want to grab that uh, payment API key. And then we're grabbing another secret. We're saying, hey, you know what? We want to grab the send mail API. What's, really cool about this is that we're not actually hard coding any secrets, usernames or passwords or anything like that within any of these configuration files, right? So all the secret data still lives in Vault. There's no secrets in any of this configuration or any of your application code. Um, and then you're able to manage all this through, through Vault. You know, if you were to manage this, uh, say you were using Vault outside of this and then you wanted to use Kubernetes secrets or something like that, it's a whole nother workflow that your developers need to manage. And it's also something that you need to think about and you know, secure and audit and log and all that stuff. So this, um, the sidecar injection feature is, should be an awesome sort of game changer for people who are already using Vault and want to use it uh, with Kubernetes. All right, so let's apply this uh, sort of real world patch and then we'll uh, jump into the container and just sort of look at the file system to see uh, what happened here. All right, so again, we're applying the patch. Um, you can see our existing uh, application is terminating. We got the, the new one is running. So then let's go ahead and connect into it. Um, actually, I need to update this here. And then if we zip over to Vault, Secrets. We should see uh, three secrets in here, right? So we have our hello world secret, right? Which is our database connection string. So I think realistically, if uh, you're going to use this feature, you know, um, your application might already be grabbing a connection string from the file system, or maybe you need to modify it to, you know, read this connection string off the uh, file system. But what's kind of cool in here is that you don't have to add um, any libraries or SDKs or API calls or anything like that out to Vault. Your application can still be fairly agnostic or you know, not have extra logic like embedded in there to grab this kind of stuff. All right, so then let's look at the payment. Boom, that's our uh, payment uh, key. And then let's look at our um, send mail. So I think this is sort of like a, a much more real world example in that, you know, you're not gonna typically just wanna inject one secret. Maybe you are for uh, say a batch job or something like that, but for a, a actual application, there's gonna be a whole slew of various secrets. And you know, the secrets might be on different um, uh, sort of TTLs or something like that, where you say, hey, you know what, this secret is only valid for a few hours. And then I want this sidecar to go fetch a new secret uh, out of vault and then I want to inject that back into the file system. Um, so it gives you tons of flexibility. And the way you control the uh, TTL is uh, on the vault side, you basically give uh, the secret uh, um, 
a time to live, you say, hey, you know what, this uh, secret's uh, valid for one hour or whatever the time limit is. And then the sidecar will be periodically checking with Vault to say, hey, you know what, I need to go back and uh, refresh this secret. And then the sidecar injects that back into your application where your application can go ahead and pick it up. So that's it for the sort of the main demos. Um, we're at 940. So I'll, I think we have time for maybe one more and then I'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions. So, um, so far we've talked about applications um, where, you know, they fire up, uh, they have a init container, which basically pre-populates the secret in your um, uh, application. The reason why we want to pre-populate it is, uh, say for example, you know, your application fires up and it looks for a secret, doesn't find it, and then it crashes or something like that, or it says errors out and it doesn't stop or uh, it doesn't start correctly. So we want to use the init container um, uh, functionality here to basically start before your application does and it pre-populates the secrets in say vault secrets. Then when your application starts, it's a, it can go and grab those secrets. And then the sidecar is sitting there like periodically updating those secrets. So, you know, it's a pretty cool feature that should cover a lot of different use cases that folks run into. Um, but say you only want it to run at a, a NIT container for maybe a one-off job or something like that. Maybe you want to do a database backup or you're doing some sort of batch processing at night where you don't want to have this sidecar container sitting there. You just say, hey, you know what? I'm, I want to fire up this job. I want to grab one secret um, that's you know, going to just be for a very brief period of time while we're doing this work. And then I want to shut down. So let's take a look at this uh, job here. So this is a job definition, which uh, takes advantage of the, you know, Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, job functionality. And, you know, the example we're giving here is say, hey, maybe you want to do a, a Postgres dump or something like that, uh, something like that. So we're going to say, hey, you know what? We want to inject these annotations. Uh, we're going to grab our hello world secret, which is our Postgres connection string. Um, and then, you know, in the container, I want to run you know, I'm just running the Alpine image here that's basically just gonna output a connection string to the uh, console. But in reality, you could say, hey, you know what? I wanna use the uh, Postgres uh, container and I wanna actually run this uh, Postgres dump uh, command. I wanna cat in our uh, connection string and I wanna say dump the contents of this, uh, you know, the database to a particular area. And then, you know, I wanna upload this to some shared storage uh, area on our company network or S3 or wherever it is. So this job, even though it's very simple here, it does give you a framework for how you could run much more complex jobs. All right, so we're gonna run the Alpine image and it's just gonna cat the connection string to the uh, uh, console. Well, actually to the logs and then we'll look at it at the console. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. Oops, so we're running this job, and then down at the bottom here, you should see, hey, you know what, we're running an init container, boom, the job's completed. And if we look at the job, uh, the logs for that, we should just see a connection string here. Yeah, perfect. So in reality, if you added a, um, say a different uh, command there to do more work, uh, let's actually just, Look at this again. You know, if we were using the uh, Postgres uh, image here and, you know, we, we changed the uh, command that it was running to something more complex, obviously you could spin this into like pretty complex logic here uh, to do cool things where you're injecting secrets from Vault right into Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so it gives you the flexibility here. I think that's it for the demos on my end since we're at about 9.45. What I think I'm going to do is we'll open it up to questions. I'm not sure, Ed, do, you, do I pass it back to you and then we'll go through the questions or what do you think? Uh, yeah, I can. I, I actually aggregated most of the questions that people have been asking so far. So we have those in that doc, but I can start reading off the first one uh, so you can get started. Um, so the first question that we got in was, if your vault cluster is external, how do the pods authenticate to vault to retrieve secrets? Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, back when we did the, um, actually, let me just uh, connect into Vault and I'll, I'll or maybe I'll just, uh, 
insert. I'm just going to add this piece here. So earlier in the um, uh, sort of webinar here, we, we chatted about, uh, you know, connecting Vault up to Kubernetes, where we said, hey, you know what, we're going to get this uh, token, and that's how you authenticate to Kubernetes uh, through its uh, certificate here. So, you know, we the Helm chart is using a bit of uh, Kubernetes magic in the background. Since we're already running on Kubernetes, we can wire it up so that, you know, we take advantage of uh, access. But if you're running an external Vault uh, cluster, you're going to have to somehow uh, tell Vault, hey, you know what, uh, here's the cluster that I want to connect to. So you're probably going to have to export this, um, uh, the certificates, and then you're going to have to set that up. Um, I think it's, let me just look through the docs here. Um, I know we, this has been mentioned. Actually, if we go to the, uh, so here's the uh, Vault. Uh, k 8s repo. This is the, actually the injector. And then if we look um, at the issue, there was an injector for a vault, e external vault server here, and it talks about docs and enhancements. Um, and it basically goes through the exact scenario that you're talking about. Hey, I have an external uh, vault server, and I want to connect it uh, into my Kubernetes cluster. How do I do that? And this, uh, this basically walks through it. Although, um, I don't think it's the most intuitive, uh, to be honest, right now, in that you know this is a, a docs enhancement that we have to do that's open right now. So we're actively working on you know making this a much more worn path because uh, it's clear that people want to do this type of thing. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, I'm happy to um, you know take this offline too, and when this feature um, or sort of docs enhancement goes out, you know maybe we can uh, highlight that in some way. Um, so the next one uh, question is, uh, does the Helm chart work with uh, Helm 3? So um, I'm actually running uh, quit Helm version. I'm running Helm version 3. So uh, the only difference, uh, so the Helm chart works with uh, version 2 and 3. The only difference uh, that you're going to run into is when you're doing uh, something like, say, Helm, uh, install, oops, install. Um, you know, you might do something like dash dash name equals vault if for Helm 2, where for Helm 3, all you're going to say is vault Helm, uh, or sorry, Helm install vault. So uh, I think that's the only thing, but it should be compatible with uh, Helm 2 and 3. So no issue there. Um, so who creates the service uh, account token in the first place? So this is uh, sort of a good question in that I think, you know, as you're, for each application, uh, this sort of would depend on sort of a best practice within your company. But I, my suggestion would probably be that you want to have a service account for each sort of application. And then you can really, and same with a policy tied to that. So that you can say, hey, you know what? this policy is only able to access these secrets. This is where you'd probably want to come up with a naming convention of, you know, what the, uh, you know, your application name and then the policy name or something like that, uh, just to make sure that everything maps consistently. If you're looking through the audit logs and you have, um, uh, hey, you know what, XYZ application is uh, using some policy that's not directly related that you can easily map it in your head, that is going to get confusing really quickly. So you need, I would highly recommend you uh, figure out a, sort of a naming schema internally. And then when you're creating your applications, you'd uh, uh, create this uh, service account. Obviously it depends on sort of the, how responsibility is divided up at your company too. If uh, you know, you have uh, two separate teams, like an ops team that's uh, managing vault and they're managing the policies and stuff like that. And then you have developers uh, that are only managing the applications. You, there's going to be need. There's going to need to be some coordination there that says, you know, when we first launch this application, yeah, we need to chat with the ops team to make sure that they populate these policies and stuff like that. So, I know that's sort of a long way of answering that question, but uh, I think you need a naming schema, and you're also going to need some coordination when the project is first kicked off. Um, probably that coordination already happens because uh, 
you know, you're going to be talking to an ops team to say, hey, you know what, we're running a new application or something like that. So you might just update your run docs or something. Um, so we're using OpenShift um, and installed AW and installed Vault on AWS. So right now, uh, behind the scenes, we're looking at how to integrate this with OpenShift. Um, I think there's a technical reason why uh, we're taking a little bit more time is that uh, uh, you need a fairly up-to-date version of Kubernetes to use this uh, uh, injection feature. And so we just want to make sure that uh, you know, we have compatibility across the board. Uh, so I don't think we have any news uh, to report on the OpenShift side of things, but uh, I definitely uh, keep an eye on that because that's something we're working on. Um, so can we inject uh, environment variables into the container? I sort of chat about this earlier in that uh, we could sort of ha half do it in that when uh, uh, an init container fires up, we can pre-populate those uh, environment variables. But if you're using dynamic secrets or um, uh, something like that, then you know we can initially pre-populate those environment variables. Uh, just to be clear, we don't support this use case today. But uh, hypothetically, we could support that. But uh, if those uh, secrets ever change, then we can't update them via the sidecar because we don't uh, share the same namespace. So it, it sort of breaks uh, the assumptions that we're making right now. That's why we don't support it. So uh, I know there's some open GitHub issues about it where people are uh, obviously asking for it. And you know, when you look at say like a 12 factor app or something like that, like a lot of people were already implementing this type of stuff. So uh, it's something we're like, I'd say actively looking at, but uh, we don't have any news on it today. Um, is the path template annotation in HCL2 syntax? It's a good question. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think uh, I'm gonna have to take this one offline and I'll, I'll chat with the developers about that. You know, that's, uh, I'm not sure uh, what syntax they're using for that or if they, uh, you know, we can. So basically what they're, uh, I think the question is, is uh, what syntax are you using in here and uh, here? I think honestly, it's just designed for this particular integration. But uh, you know, I, I can take this offline and show with the uh, developers about that. Um, so uh, there's a question in here about, uh, hey, you know what? I want to use the uh, uh, sidecar injection feature, but uh, do I have to use a Helm chart to do it? Um, so Basically, hey, you know what? Uh, I basically use the Helm chart to, to uh, you know, install Vault, install the sidecar injection feature, and wire everything up. I only did that just because it's super simple, you know, to run, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Helm install Vault and have it all configured and get it all wired up behind the scenes. That's great for a demo. But I think in reality, a lot of people aren't using the Helm chart. Um, you know, we only released it, say, within the last six months. Um, and we're starting to support it now. And uh, hopefully that support will be expanded in the near future here. But um, the reality is, hey, you know what? I already have Vault running on Kubernetes. And I want to use this uh, sidecar injection feature. Uh, what do I do? Well, um, I this isn't the most, uh, say, simplest thing to do, right? You can go and dig through these templates and you can uh, figure out, hey, okay, uh, how did they uh, configure these various features to you know, augment the mutation and admission webhook? Um, I'd say this isn't something that like, uh, is uh, beginner friendly, but if you're familiar with uh, Kubernetes, yeah, you can go through these various uh, YAML configuration files and uh, you know, wire this up yourself. I only did it just because it's uh, super simple to set up, but um, it it is totally a supported uh, use case to do this yourself. It's just um, you know you're probably going to run into various things. That's why it's um, useful to understand the workflow of hey, okay, I'm uh, I'm augmenting this uh, mutation admission webhook, and you know I got to wire up Vault, and so that's why it's useful to sort of understand things from the ground up, and then you can go and uh, implement it yourself. Um, so, sorry, I'm just uh, reading the questions in the uh, doc here. 
Um, so can secret data be appended to an existing file? Um, it's a good question. I, in, you know, my various uh, uh, work with this, I haven't seen it. I'd imagine it just overwrites the file. So uh, I guess it would depend on your use case of like what you're trying to do, but maybe we could support that. But I think right now it just is gonna create a new file and it would probably overwrite whatever is there, especially if say, you know, vault slash vault secrets doesn't exist. Um, you know, if you pre-populate it and, uh, you know, you have a secret there, my sort of gut feeling would be that, you know, it's going to blow away whatever's there. Um, you might be able to modify things to do that, but, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know, it seems a little bit hacky to me to, to try to do that. Uh, just because, you know, you could get into a state where you don't know exactly what you altered, uh, or say as the uh, sidecar is continually checking, we're gonna have to have like additional logic in there to say, hey, do we already inject this secret? Uh, so we're gonna be grepping through this file. So yeah, I, I, I think obviously technically you could do it, but uh, that's not something that uh, we support today just because like, you know, there's an extra logic that we'd uh, need to have in there. Um, so we're at, uh, uh, we got a couple minutes left, so I'll try to zip through a couple more uh, questions. But, um, you know, if you asked a question and I uh, didn't answer it, uh, we should be able to answer it offline too. Um, uh, seems like it's going to amount to a lot of annotations, uh, say for a, a monolith, monolithic app, um, you know, when you're communicating with the uh, various uh, Kubernetes APIs. So, this actually brings up uh, kind of a cool uh, scenario here. So I think what uh, this person is mentioning is saying, um, um, let's look at this real world example. Hey, you know what? Um, for a real world application, yeah, I'm gonna be injecting a whole slew of secrets. And yeah, now all of a sudden I need to maintain this big YAML file that's doing all these injections and you know we're doing all these sort of templates and things like that. Um, so there is sort of a more advanced uh, use case here that I didn't mention. And that's, you're able to use um, uh, Kubernetes um, config maps to basically um, uh, put all that configuration right into Kubernetes so you don't have to be maintaining this stuff. So I, um, for this particular user, I'd, or the person who asked this question, I'd, I'd zip over to the uh, vault documentation. Um, you know, if you just uh, go to our website, you know, or if you just Google this, oh, oops, you'll be able to uh, find this. Also, I'll, I'll have all the reference links at the end. But um, uh, here is a config map example where, um, you know, you can sort of limit the uh, amount of annotations that you're sending over and sort of bundle this all up in a config map. Um, so uh, is there any similarity to uh, say Docker Compose where I'm, um, you know, injecting environment variables. I think I sort of already answered that one in that, you know, that's something I think a lot of people are asking for and want, but we haven't found uh, sort of a, a way to do it that covers all use cases in that, um, you know, yeah, we can pre-populate them with the init container, but the sidecar container is not gonna keep them updated. So, you know, it depends on your use case too. If, hey, you know what, your secrets are never changing, then maybe you could uh, um, use the environment variable uh, uh, maybe you could hack it together to use environment variables, but uh, you know, if you're using an advanced, uh, um, say dynamic secrets or something like that, uh, that uh, with secrets that expire, then yeah, it's going to break that use case. So, um, and maybe it's worthwhile for us to take this feedback back and uh, explore this, but, um, right now it's, we don't support it. Um, I think that's coming up on time. So I wanted to thank everyone uh, very much for adding, um, you know, adding your questions in here. And, you know, I apologize to the folks that um, I didn't get to answer the question. There's a, actually a whole slew of other questions in here. So um, I'll take these questions offline and I'll uh, shoot you emails. And uh, I just want to say thanks very much and I'll kick it back to Ed to uh, close things out. Thanks, Justin. Um, and I, I, again, I want to kind of like echo Justin's message and thank everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar in a few days and we have the list of all the questions that you have so we'll be sure to like respond to those either in the email follow-up that we will be sending out or as part of the the docs and the the blog post that we're going to share with like all of the the 
answers that we had to the other questions as well. So you'll you'll be sure to to get the information that you're looking for, um, and just be on the lookout for that follow up email within a, a couple of days. So once we have the the recording that's like a, a processed by our our team, uh, we'll be able to send out all the uh, additional information that everyone is looking for. Uh, so thanks again for your patience today, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.